through the streets of Soho in the rain. He was looking for the place called Lee Hall Fuchs. Gonna get a big dish of beef chow mein. Kitchen door. You better not let him in. Little old lady got mutilated late last night. Werewolves of London again. Welcome to tonight's study session. Excited to have you all here with us this evening. Uh, we are going to dive right in as soon as I get a list of uh, a few different options. Okay, we got calculations, law, and contracts. All right, calculations, law, and contracts should get us through, excuse me, the evening. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So let's go ahead and jump in with real estate calculations. If it is your first time joining us, or if it's been a while since you've joined us, we are going to, I'm going to read the question, read the answers, and then you put an A, B, C, or D in the chat. All right. Question number one, Joe is purchasing a property at $35 per foot. Uh, for a lot, for front foot, for a lot that is 600 by 1452, how much did he pay for the front foot of the lot? So how much did he pay for the lot? $35 a front foot, 600 by 1452. Did he pay 23,000? A, B, 20,500, C, 21,000, or D, 20,000? A lot of C's in the chat. So we'll go with C as, try to go with C as our answer. And that is correct. So very simply, the front foot is the first measurement there. So 35 times 600 gets you to 21,000. Question number two, if a property sells for $289,000 at a cap rate of 9.75%, what should Deborah offer if she wants at a cap rate of 10%? 
Is it A, 281,775, B, 2.589 million, C, 308,975, or D, 2.412 million? What should Deborah offer to get this at a 10 cap? All right, so this seems like one worth working through. <clears throat> so the uh, this is testing your knowledge of the IVR method, right? Um, so income equals value times rate. Income equals value times rate. So to get to, we need to know all three parts, then we can know, or if you know two, you can know all three. Once you know all three, you can adjust. So we know the value, 289,000. We know the rate, 9.75. So what we need to get is the current state of the income. So we take 289,000 and we multiply by 0 0.0975 or 9.75%. That means the annual income of this property is 28,177 dollars uh, and 50 cents. So now if we know income and we know rate, we can find value. And that's what we want to calculate here is what is the value that uh, or the price that Deborah should offer. So this is the income, 28,177 dollars and 50 cents. We're going to divide that by the 10 for the cap rate, right? So I equals V times R. So I divided by R equals V. So divide by 0.1. And that gets you 281,775, which is A. And that's correct. You will have a question that tests I, IVR. Just remember, I equals V times R. And you can divide... Uh, I by R, multiply V by R, um, you know, and get the missing piece. All right, a real property transfer fee of two mils on the sale of real estate at a total consideration of $89,500 equals what? A, $8.95, B, $89.50, C, $179, or D, $1,790. So anytime you see mill, you're going to divide by a thousand. So eighty nine thousand five hundred divided by a thousand is eighty nine dollars and fifty cents. We see the transfer fee of two mills, so we simply multiply that by two to get one hundred and seventy nine dollars. Question number four. Bill was thinking of purchasing an apartment building. He wanted a 10% return on his investment and asked to see the books for the building. There are four apartments on each floor of a three-story building. The rent of the uh, apartments on the first floor are 400. Then they increase by $50 per month per apartment uh, for each floor. So that would be 400 on the first floor, 450 on the second floor, and 500 on the third floor. 
Bill noticed a loss of rent through vacancy and collection losses of 8%, and he figured the operating expenses averaged uh, $610 a month. But with all this information, what's the most Bill should pay uh, for the building? A, $596,000 and change. B, $590,000 and change. C, $648,000, or D, $522,960. So this is going to be the IVR method again, but remember, income in the I is going to be net income. So you have to calculate all of the rents collected, back out vacancy, and back out expenses, and do it at the annual level. So go ahead and work this problem uh and see what answer you get to or let me know where you get stuck and we'll work through it together but you gotta attempt it If you get stuck, put a question mark in the chat or let me know where you're stuck, which part you're stuck on, and I'll be more than happy to help. If you have no idea what to do or where to go next, by all means, just uh, put a question mark in the chat. All right, let's go ahead and work through this one together, right? So the, we need total rents minus vacancy minus uh, um, expenses. So total rents, three apart, four apartments at $400, four at 450 and four at 500, right? So, uh, that's 1600 in total rents for the first floor plus 1800 in total rents for the second floor plus 2000 oh excuse me 1600 okay 5400 in total rents now it says that 8% loss to vacancy which means that there's a 92% collection rate so we're going to multiply this by 0.92 that's uh, $4,968 of rents collected each month minus $610 in monthly expenses. So that means that there's a monthly income of $4,358. Now we need this in an annual number, so we're going to multiply it by 12. That gets to $52,296. So 
We know we want a 10% return, so we divide by 10% or divide by 0.1 to get to $522,960. So the difference is uh, you were correct uh, on your total rents, Nicole, but we need to back out the vacancy before we back out the expenses, before we calculate the cap rate. Oops. All right, next question. Question number five. The subject property is a three bedroom ranch with two full baths and a two car garage. In the same home, there is a nearly identical home with four bedrooms that just sold for $110,000. And the appraisal, appraiser estimates the value of the fourth bedroom uh, at $5,000. Based on this information, what would the subject property's value be? A, 115,000, B, 90,000, C, 110,000, or D, 105,000. D is correct. So that fourth bedroom is $5,000. And since the subject property has three bedrooms, we just back out, uh, back out five, um, back out $5,000. Um, and there you have it. Next question. In the sale of a 150 by 110 foot property with two at $2.50 per cent or 50 cents per square foot, if the broker's commission is 6%, how much does the owner realize from the transaction? A, 39,000, B, 38,000, C, 38,775, or D, 38,500? So 150 foot by 110 foot property, $2.50 per square foot, 6% commission. Right, we've got some C's coming into the chat here. Let's see if that's correct. And it is. So a two-part problem, a three-part problem, really. So we have 150 feet by 110 feet. So we need to get our total square footage. And that's going to be 16,500. Now multiply that by 250 to get the total cost of the property. And then we know there's a 6% commission. So 100% minus 6% is 94% going to the owner. So multiply by 0 0.94, 38,775. Question number seven, a broker has 3.75 acres listed at uh, $0.215 per square foot, 21 and a half cents per square foot. What's the total listing price of the property? Is it A, 35,000 and change, or 35, 120, 25? B, $37,050, uh, C, 41,150, or D, $35,012.05. $35, so whether you believed it or not, uh, you are going to uh, need to know the number of square feet per acre.
Looks like A is the popular answer and it's correct. So 43,560, that's how many square feet are in an acre, times 3.75 equals 163,350 square feet times 0.215 for the cost, $35,120.25. Question number eight, the square footage of a three-story building is 60 feet by 53 feet. Uh, the, squ the square footage of this building is what? If it's 60 by 53 and it's three stories, is it A, 9,540, B, 6,360 square feet plus the garage, C, 5,940, or D, 3,180? Yes, the A's have it, and we love to see that. So it's 60 times 53, but then it's three floors. So make sure you read that question fully. Question number nine. A property is uh, 100 feet long by 100 feet wide. Property has deed restrictions that require 10-foot setbacks on each side and a 25 25 foot setback at the front of the property and a 30 foot setback at the rear. How much of the property is available for building use? Is it A, 260 square feet, B, 10,000 square feet, C, 360 square feet, or D, 3,600 square feet? So on a, on a question like this, on a problem um, like this, you have a, a 100 by 100 box, right? And then the setbacks are going to shrink that box. So instead of it being 100 by 100, you have 10 foot setbacks on each side. So now it's uh, 100 feet long by 80 feet wide. But then I also have 25 and 30 set foot backs, uh, 30 foot setbacks on uh, the front and back. So it's instead of it being um, 100 by 100, my actual buildable area is only 80 by 45. So I, after I subtract out those setbacks, I multiply 80 by 45, and I get what Nicole Lender did at 360 square feet, and that is accurate. Question number 10, a property owner paid $25 per front foot for a lot that was 600 by 1452, how much did they pay for the lot? A, 14,500, B, 16,000, C, 15,000, or D, 15,500? You guys were all over that, it's C, $15,000. Great work, got them all. We'll go back and hit law next. Um, assuming we meant uh, license law and rules of the Ohio Real Estate Commission or brokerage relationships for agency law. I'm thinking you meant the first one, license law, but you got to tell me what you meant with law. Yes, license law and rules of the Ohio Real Estate Commission. All right. <clears throat> Question number one, what language does state statute require in a listing agreement? A, a statement that blockbusting is illegal. 
B, the definition of steering, C, explanation of fair housing, or D, full legal description of the property? Correct answer is going to be A, statement that block busting is illegal. That is required by state statute in every listing agreement. Question number two, a salesperson asks that the broker return her license to the division of real estate so she may transfer to a new brokerage. Sales agent makes the request in a certified letter, but after 10 days, the broker has not mailed the license back to the division. What is true? A, the sales agent will lose the license. B, the sales agent must wait for the broker to return it. C, since the broker owns the agent's license, the broker may decide whether or not to send it to the division, or D, the broker could lose their license for failing to return that to the sales, return the sales agent's license. D is correct here. Um, there is an obligation for brokers to return the license within uh, 10 days. Question number three, a sales agent is advertising his firm's listed property in the local newspaper. The sales agent must make sure that A, the agent's name and the broker's name are in different colored type. B, the agent's name and broker's name are in the same font. C, that they appear in equal or greater prominence. The broker's name is in equal or greater prominence of the agent. Or D, the agent's name and the broker's name are the same size. Yes, it is the equal or greater prominence law that takes effect here, meaning the brokerage name or broker's name can be larger, but it cannot be smaller. It, has, it can be the same size, but it can't be smaller. Question number four, the maximum number of DBAs or doing business as names that a broker is allowed to operate under is A, no more than three, B, no more than two, C, no more than five, or D, only one. You guys were already on that one with C, huh? No more than five. You can have up to five DBAs as a brokerage. Question number five, broker X is managing a client's five unit apartment complex. The broker receives rent deposits of $100 for each unit. What must the broker do with the rent deposit receipts? A, deposit them in the office management account. B, Co-mingle the funds in the trust account. C, deposit them in the broker's trust account. Or D, deposit them in the property management account for the client's name. D is going to be your winner here. Property management accounts must be established in each client's name, and that's where deposits go. They are able to earn interest, unlike a broker's trust account, but that interest belongs to that client. A buyer makes an offer on a property. The seller issues a counter offer, which uh, the buyer signed and the selling agent delivered to the listing agent. The buyer passes a FISBO and likes it better. He offers on the FISBO and the seller accepts, which statement is true. A, the contract on the first house is not enforceable. B, neither contract is enforceable. C, only the first contract is valid. Or D, both contracts are valid. Yeah, D is going to be the correct answer here. This client is now under contract for two different houses. They say you can only live in one, but who knows? Maybe this guy will pull it off. Question number seven. When would a license be considered inactive? A, when the salesperson directs the brokerage to... Uh, return the license to the division. 
B, when the broker dies, C, when the salesperson does not have a transaction within a mandated period of time, or D, when the salesperson fails to turn in proof of CE. Hey, whenever that salesperson directs the broker to return it, um, it is a voluntary status. You cannot be made involuntarily in a Question number eight, who administers real estate license laws? Is it A, the Real Estate Commission, B, the Division of Real Estate, C, the Department of Commerce, or D, the police? A, looks like we have mostly A's in the chat. And the answer is B, the Division of Real Estate administers license law. Division of Real Estate responsible for license law. Sorry if I pulled the trigger a little quick there. Maybe some of those A's were from the last answer. I don't know. Question number nine, an auditor appointed by the Ohio Superintendent's Office asked to review a broker's records. What must the broker make available? A, the broker's income tax returns, B, the broker's personal property taxes, C, sales contracts, but not listings, or D, sales contracts and listing contracts, whether sold or not. D is correct. It is going to be sales contracts and listing contracts, whether or not they sold. Question number 10. Which of the following is not a management level licensee? A, a salaried licensed office manager, B, an associate broker, C, a team leader, or D, a new salesperson? D, the new salesperson. Everyone else is in a leadership or management position, so they will have a management level. They'll be a management level licensee. Um, a buyer is going to make an offer on a seller's home. The listing agent asks the buyer for $1,000 in earnest money. The buyer does not want to give $1,000 in earnest money, but the listing agent says it's state law. What's true? A, the buyer must give the money. B, earnest money is set by state law. C, earnest money is actually set by federal law. Or D, the listing agent is wrong. There is no state law requiring a minimum or maximum amount of earnest money. D is the correct answer. Earnest money is good faith money and there is no set amount you can offer on properties with no earnest money. Um, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, it usually weakens the offer a considerable amount, but. Uh, question number 12, homosexuality is protected under what federally protected class? A, national origin, B, familial status, C, it is not protected, or D, sex. Yes, sees the correct answer here. It is not protected. Question number 13, a buyer makes an offer to buy a house and faxes the offer to the seller in another state. The seller, upon receipt, signs the offer intending to mail it back to the buyer the next morning. In the meantime, the buyer telephones the seller and withdraws the offer. What is true? A, there is no contract as the acceptance has not been delivered to the buyer. B, there was never a rightful offer as the offer was faxed and the seller must have received the original offer. 
C, both parties are now bound uh, to the terms of the contract. Or D, uh, there is a contract as the seller has accepted the buyer's offer. Yeah, the correct answer here is going to be A, there's no contract because acceptance has not been delivered, not been delivered. Question number 14, buyers make an offer to purchase a property and to place $1,000 in earnest money into the broker's trust account. The sellers want the earnest money check made payable to them instead. The sales agent should A, tell the sellers that the sales agent may accept a check only made payable to the broker. B, write a counteroffer stipulating the seller's request. C, not present the offer to the sellers. Or D, ignore the seller's request as this is illegal and the sales agent does not have to follow an illegal request. We got some A's and B's in the chat. B is the correct answer. You can, earnest money can be made out to uh, uh, whomever. Um, it, it cannot be made payable to the sales agent though. Anyone else? Uh, a third party, a bank, a title company, uh, the broker, whomever. Um, nine, 99% of the time, it's going to be the title company. Question number 15, a broker and seller agree verbally that the broker will assist them in finding a buyer. The broker finds a buyer for the seller, but the seller refuses to pay the broker a commission. What statement is true? A, the broker cannot recover because the listing was not in writing. B, the seller must pay the commission. C, the broker can recover under the statute of frauds. Or D, the sales agent can sue the seller for not paying the commission. So we have an A and a D. Somebody break the tie between A and D. A, all right. And that's correct. All listing agreements must be in writing to be enforceable in the court of law. Question number 16, when must a broker record a written lease of satisfaction of the broker lien in the county recorder's office in which the lien was recorded? Is it A, within 15 days? B, the owner must file that release? Uh, C, within 10 days? Or D, within 90 days? Like we got some A's and C's, so 10 or 15 days. Yep, another C came in. We'll go with C. And that is correct. Ohio Revised Code states that release and satisfaction must be recorded within 10 days. Question number 17, what would be a violation of Ohio licensing law? A, making an earnest money to uh Money deposit check payable to the salesperson. B, making the earnest money check payable to the seller. C, making it payable to the buyer's broker. Or D, to the seller's broker. Which one can you not do?
A is correct. You cannot make it payable to the salesperson. Question number 18, after recording an affidavit of lien with the recorder's office, the broker shall provide a copy of the lien affidavit where a contract for sale or other conveyance of the lien property has been entered into to the A, superintendent, B, owner of the lien property, C, prospect of the transferee, or D, the owner of the lien, proper, lien property and the prospective transferee. D's in the chat and D's are correct, provided to both parties. Question number 19, if given the choice, what type of listing agreement would sell, would a seller probably prefer? A, a net listing, B, an exclusive right to sell, C, an open listing, or D, an exclusive agency agreement? Yes, the answer is D here because an exclusive agency agreement, if the seller brings the buyer, the seller brings the buyer, then they don't have to pay a commission. It's actually the only one of these scenarios where they will not have to pay a commission. And question number 20, although not mandated by statute, the Ohio Division of Real Estate recommends that for purposes of document handling, and record keeping, A, all agents should have ready access to all files. B, all files must be listed on the internet for public access. C, a non-licensed clerical employee should have control of all files. Or D, only the agent who works the file should have access. going to be C, that non-licensed clerical person uh, should have access to all the files. Um, and that's where control should reside. All right, good stuff. We're going to jam through a few contract questions here uh, in the time that we have remaining. Um, and uh, we'll go from there. All right, question number one. When an offer is presented, the seller may A, accept the offer so it becomes a contract, B, make a counter offer, C, reject the offer, or D, all of the above. D is correct. Accept, reject, or counter. Question number two. A broker deposits a buyer's $500 earnest money check into the broker's personal checking account. The broker is guilty of what? Is it A, capitalization, B, commingling, C, condemnation, or D, cooperation? B is correct. That is commingling. Those funds must go into a broker trust account that does not earn interest. Question number three, a buyer makes an offer to buy a house for $50,000. The seller doesn't accept the offer, but responds that they'll accept no less than 55. The seller just made a, a bilateral enforceable contract, B an option, C a counter offer, or D a unilateral enforceable contract. And you got that. It's a counter offer. Now remember this with counter offer guys, it's actually a rejection of the first offer and a putting forth of an entirely new offer. Question number four, a buyer made an earnest money deposit of $500 on a $40,000 house, but withdrew the offer before the seller accepted it. The broker should dispose of the earnest money by A, paying it to the court, B, keeping it for commission, C, returning it to the buyer, or D, giving it to the seller. That's right. It's the buyer's money. It never stopped being the buyer's money. It was just in the possession of the agent. Question number five, a lender qualifies a new borrower who signs a note and mortgage. Then the terms of the note and mortgage are transferred to a new mortgager, relieving the original mortgager of liability. This is known as A, assignment, 
B, subjugation, C, novation, or D, defeasance? It's A or C, I'm seeing more A's. So we'll go with A. And the answer was C, substitution of a new contract with the withdrawing party being relieved of liability is novation. That is novation. Transferring one party's interest in a contract to another is assignment. Question number six, a seller signs an exclusive right to sell agreement with a broker. However, the seller's brother-in-law makes an offer on the property the next day, not realizing it had been placed in a listing. Which statement is true? A, the seller will not have to pay a commission. B, the seller, since the seller was found by the buyer, the listing is void. C, the broker is entitled to a commission. Or D, the broker is not entitled to a commission. Because it's an exclusive right to sell, that means they have a right to a commission no matter who finds the buyer. If it was an exclusive agency agreement in this scenario, they would not owe a commission. But since it's exclusive right to sell, they have the exclusive right to a commission when it does sell. Question number seven, if a broker receives two offers for the same house at the same time, one agent is a cooperating broker and the other an agent from his, his own agent from his own brokerage, he should A, submit both offers, B, submit the other, uh, uh, his agent's offer to the seller first, C, reject both offers, or D, submit the cooperating offer, uh, cooperating broker's offer first. Uh, you guys got that one right. You submit all offers when you receive them to the sellers, regardless of who they come from. Question number eight, which is not essential, uh, which is not an essential element to a real estate contract. A, offer and acceptance. B, lawful and possible object. C, valuable consideration. Or D, uh, good consideration. Good consideration is not required because it's things like love and kindness and happiness and all those other things which cannot be contracted. Valuable consideration, things like money and jewelry and real estate, lawful and possible objects is required as well as offer and acceptance. Question number nine, which would a buyer prefer, land installment contract or purchase money mortgage? A, a purchase money mortgage. B, either as both convey legal title. C, either as both convey equitable title. Or D, land installment contracts. A, purchase money mortgage title transfers. Uh, um, they'll receive the deed to the property on the day of closing, whereas in the land installment contract, they'll receive it at the end. Question number 10, earnest money is best described as A, good faith money, B, consideration for the sale of the property, C, money deposited by the purchaser for the expense of examining the title, or D, the commission paid to the broker. Yes, indeed. You guys nailed it. It is good faith money deposited by the purchaser at the time of signing the offer. Question number 11, the seller agrees to an exclusive agency agreement. The day after the listing is signed, the seller's brother-in-law decides to make an offer on the property without knowing it's been listed. What statement's true? A, the buyer will have to pay a commission. B, the seller will have to pay a commission. C, the broker's not entitled to a commission. Or D, since the buyer was found during the listing period, the broker will be entitled to a commission. C is correct. The broker is entitled to a commission. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I clicked through that. They are not entitled to a commission because that was an exclusive agency agreement. So they are not. You guys got it right. No commission is due there. Question number 12. An, a, an agreement of sale is a contract between A, the seller and the broker, B, the buyer and the broker, C, the seller, the buyer, and the mortgagee, or D, the buyer and the seller.
He is correct. The buyer and the seller. That's who the agreement is between. Question number 13, a bilateral contract is one where one that A is void, B is unenforceable, C binds both parties to an agreement, or D binds only one party to an agreement. Yeah, bilateral means by in two, as two, as in both parties are bound. Unilateral agreements are ones where only one party is bound to the agreement and the other has what is referred to as an option. Question number 14, Mary buys Sally's property, which is subject to a mortgage. After five years of payment, Mary defaults and misses a payment. Which is the appropriate remedy for the original mortgager? A, they should sue both Mary and Sally as they're both liable for the mortgage. B, the mortgager has no recourse because there was no assumption. C, they should sue only Mary as she assumed Sally's mortgage. Or D, sue only Sally as Mary took only the property subject to a mortgage and there was no assumption. The correct answer here is going to be B. The original mortgager is Sally. So it's she's subject to a mortgage. Uh, Mary bought the property, but Sally is still the original mortgager. Um, and since um, they're the original, she's the original mortgager in this uh equation. And don't don't get me wrong, most people confuse mortgager and mortgagee. Uh, the mortgagee is the bank. When you, most people say get a mortgage, you're actually giving a mortgage, right? Because you're mortgaging that deed. So since Mary bought that property from Sally, which was subject to a mortgage, um, that makes Sally the mortgage or. Uh, it does not state that there was any loan assumption. Therefore, Sally remains totally liable and cannot sue Mary. The bank's the mortgagee and they can only sue Sally. So there's no recourse for Sally, the original mortgager. Question number 15, the law requiring certain real estate contracts to be in writing to be enforceable is called A, the written instrument law, B, the statute of frauds, C, the parole evidence rule, or D, statute of limitations. B is correct. That is called the statute of fraud. All right, gang. Good session tonight. A lot of strong answers there. A lot of strong performance. Uh, we are uh, 25 days left in the year, guys. Uh, so if you haven't scheduled your exam, schedule it. If you haven't applied or sent down your retake, get in touch with me. Let us help you do that. You guys are doing a great job. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, we will be back here next week, same time. Uh, the Saturday study study session should still be going on. I think it was off the weekend after Thanksgiving, but it should be back on now. Um, that information for that is in the Facebook group. Um, so if you have not joined the Future Real Estate Agents of Northeast Ohio, please do that. We put some information in there. And of course, when you're going for your exam, reach out, get people to wish you luck. If you pass your exam, let us know so we can all celebrate you. And of course, Keep me posted on everything you're doing and make sure I know what you, where you're at in the process um, so we can help you. If you have questions, if you haven't heard from PSI testing, uh, if you're waiting to hear from us, just reach out. You can't, uh, can't over-communicate. We're here to help. Um, and that's all for tonight, guys. See you back here next week. Uh, and we will, uh, we'll see you soon. Take care, gang.